A very warm welcome to a special edition of the user manual for Digital Humanists, our ongoing series. We are back today at the Ars Electronica Center in the Ars Electronica Labs. My name is Christina Maurer and I'm joined today by my colleague Laura Welzenbach, the head of the Ars Electronica Export Department. The user manual for Digital Humanists is part of the European Platform for Digital Humanism a platform for discourse, exhibitions, conferences, workshops and capacity building programs that break down complex technologies and help us in developing a critical understanding of them. With the European Platform for Digital Humanism, we bring together artists, creative technologists, researchers and policy makers to discuss what it means to live in today's digital society. And we invite audiences to imagine a new future and pose the question, how can we move forward from our role as mere consumers and data generators? How can we become empowered, develop agency and become responsible for how technologies impact our day to day in the future? Within the platform and the European projects linked to it, a special focus lies on residency and capacity building projects for artists and creative producers that bring them together with industry partners or research institutions to co-develop projects. In the end, these programs lead to new ideas and approaches for both the participating artists as well as the host institutions. Today, we are actually going to focus on one such program that is currently being coordinated by Ars Electronica Export, an art science residency enabled by the art collection Deutsche Telekom. And I am delighted to hand over now to Laura Welzenbach, who is going to lead us through today's session and is going to chat with some exciting guests and collaborators. Thank you so much, Christina, for the amazing introduction and also elaborating what the user manual is and what contents we uh, show here and discuss here. And I'm also excited to have you back at the end. In the meantime, other guests will be here in the studio also. Um, I want to start with introducing the program real quick. Uh, the Art Science Residency, enabled by Art Collection Deutsche Telekom, kicked off about a year ago. The art collection focuses on supporting artists from Eastern Europe or do have some sort of connection to Eastern Europe. And they want to extend their reach uh, with building bridges to art and science research. We, as Ars Electronica, are indeed very excited to be their partner in crime in doing so. And with our regular collaborator, the Johannes Kepler University, and in particular, Martina Mara, head of the Robopsychology Lab there, we also found an amazing science partner to get this project going. After an open call and uh, a jury meeting, we were happy to announce Kiriaki Goni, Greek artist, um, as the first winner of this art science residency. She started with uh, her mentoring session with Professor Mara in January, in February, actually this year. We announced her as a winner in January. So we are kind of like two thirds in the project now and she is in the middle of producing her artwork which will then be shown at this year's festival. Reason enough for us now to take a look where we are at. So let's get started with our first part uh, of today's episode. Antje Hunthausen, Vice President Brand Experience Deutsche Telekom will tell us more about the mission of the art collection Deutsche Telekom and particular the idea behind this art science residency. Enjoy! My words, My words are, transmitted are transmitted by the substance of the sea. I am the mouth that produces waves. As Deutsche Telekom, we open new technological and communication opportunities to enrich people's lives. We're acting responsibly and enabling relevant and sustainable experiences for all generations. But we're much more than being a worldwide leading telco. In 2010, we started a new exciting journey by founding the Art Collection Telecom. This collection comprises more than 300 works by artists from over 20 countries. It spreads over all media, drawing, painting, photography, video, installation and performance.
Günther Hundhausen, who's responsible for the art collection on the part of Deutsche Telekom, knows how important it is for an art collection to be taken seriously and to be explored in different contexts by a broader public. In general, art speaks for itself, but it always helps to give the viewer a clue. For us, art is one of the best ways to communicate. It tells us about the world and about personal experiences, about dreams and longings. It draws utopias. The Art Collection Telecom consciously focuses on contemporary art from Eastern Europe. In these countries, political, social and cultural challenges are essential and the support the Art Collection Telecom offers to artists is substantial. My mass is greater than you. And the cloud of my love is greater than your understanding. With this engagement, we improve the infrastructure for art in these countries and we make an important contribution to an open, diverse and communicative European cultural network. Not only for the mediation of the artworks, but also in the production, Technology is key. Your joints, your joints fall, apart, fall apart under, under my gaze, my gaze. Your warm evening, your warm evening turned freezing cold. Many of our artists are experimenting with new technologies. To foster this aspect, we've founded the Art Science Residency with Ars Electronica in Linz. The programme promotes interaction between artists, researchers and scientists. The residency is addressed to artists who work at the interface between art, technology and science. Although the Art Collection Telecom is still a relatively young collection, we've already realised many exhibitions in cooperation with leading museums all over Europe during this first decade. And artworks are presented in the Deutsche Telekom buildings and offices as well. The Art Collection Telecom is an essential part of our corporate citizenship that makes the difference. A success story to be continued. Yes, art raises questions and it draws utopias, as Antje Hunthausen just said. And now we want to check out the utopias Kiriaki Goni, our current art science resident here, works on and develops. Kiriaki is an Athens original. She was born and raised there and still works and lives there. I work across media, creating expanded multi-layered installations. That's how she describes her project and her research. I connect the local with the global by critically touching upon questions of datafication, surveillance, distributed networks and infrastructures, ecosystems, human and other than human relations. How does that look like? We will check out a previous work that was also part last year at the Ars Electronica Festival. It is an exhibition shown at Onassis Degi in Greece and we will check out a little glimpse to the tour now. Enjoy! I started working at Data Garden in 2018. My grandfather had a small garden when he would take care of his trees and plants, addressing them tenderly, always in the first person. I sort of feel that this work is dedicated to him who passed away that year. This is when I first thought of storing digital memory in plants. Was something like that even possible? Would I tend my digital data differently if it was stored in plants? What would this shared memory mean for my relation to other species, to the planet and to the technological mediated society? These questions were the fuel to investigate further and begin building Data Garden. During this research, I reached out to scholars and scientists, Karen Pfister, Mel Hogan, Edward Perello and Labrus Tsunis, who responded kindly and their input enriched this installation. The Onassis Foundation, through the team of digital innovation under the direction of Prodromos Tsiavos, supported this project from the very beginning, and I'm grateful for their trust. Data Garden would be initially presented on March 2020, but the show was postponed due to the lockdown. Now, in the post-COVID period, what this work observes and discusses has only been intensified. Data Garden is timelier than ever. 
environmental realization, personal data violation and surveillance, the need to connect, the need to return to our inner thoughts and speculating about the future. For that reason, together with the NASIS Foundation, we decided that this exhibition should open online for initiating a very much needed dialogue with the public. Data Garden is a multimedia installation which consists of 10 pieces. The main piece, a video essay, is densely interconnected with all the other pieces. A polyphonic sound piece, four interviews with scholars and scientists, drawings and digital prints, and an AR portrait. All these parts produce a right of passage for the viewer. Data Garden is a demanding work. It demands viewers' presence and time. I consider presence and time as the most valuable assets of the post-COVID era. At the same time, I seek to construct a space for pause and reflection. Data Garden is presented in the underground exhibition space of Anasis Stegi. When entering this dark box, the ritual begins. I'm very happy to have Kiriaki now here in our virtual studio and live joining us on Zoom right now. Hello, Kiriaki. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me today. Thanks for being here. Uh, and I will jump right into uh, the first question right away. And uh, I wanted to ask you as an as a opener, a very easy opener, um, what does art bring to science or also other fields from your very own perspective as an artist? Actually, I think that art offers a, a framework, a space, so to say, allowing um, to allowing experimentation, reflection, and uh, questioning of certain themes and uh, and subject. Let's say um, I think it's it's kind of interesting when you have this opportunity to see these other perspectives through, through art. And from my own experience, when collaborating with scientists and scholars from uh, various disciplines, I see that this works also from their uh, side, let's say. They're, they're, they're happy that they can um, communicate in this framework that art offers, they communicate they can communicate things from their own disciplines in a more relaxed and open way. Um, and also at the same time, I feel like art offers a framework and a context where the audiences can also interact more freely in a way and more experimental with um, science or technology, which maybe could be uh, in, in, other, in other cases a little bit more closed to their own selves in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, changing perspectives is definitely uh, an interesting thing that's also needed in research and science and artists can indeed help with that. And you also worked with artists uh, a lot before, as we've also seen just in the, in the excerpt video that we just shown. And I just wanted to ask, like, what is your new take on with this project or with the, uh, with the telecom residency now? Um. I now in this in this residency in uh, in collaboration with Ars Electronica and Deutsche Telekom, I'm looking into the field of AI and spe specifically in the use of AI in the uh, digital assistants and the voice interfaces, um, which is for me it's a very interesting field. Anyways, um, I'm continuing my uh, practice and my research interests, let's say, which have been during the last years uh, focusing on, on surveillance data uh, and the machine and the relationship between machine and human um, and also uh, with environment, let's say, with the environment. Mm -hmm. In this specific case, I work on voice interfaces and digital assistants. Nice. Uh, you also had a mentor in this program. We had a great science uh, collaborator, the Johannes Kepler University here in Linz, and Martina Mara was one person that gave you different input for your research in this project. How was it to work it, to work with her? Actually, it was very interesting. We had uh, 
three sessions with Martina, uh, and she was really open and uh, uh, she shared uh, lots regarding the research on the university. Uh, we had the opportunity to exchange ideas. I also uh, offered here some insights in my artistic, in my previous artistic work, and I think this was a very um, helpful and um, uh, uh, and interesting exchange from again two different points of view that actually are looking on same things, and you know they're really willing. To make things happen in a in a uh, in a way that it's uh, you know involving and bringing different sides uh, together. So uh, it was a very 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 good experience. Nice. Um, you also said uh, so. With this now, we also know that the, the program started with the mentoring sessions. So you you checked in with Ma Martina and talked about different ideas and and theories. And how does your process then look like? Or how would you describe your practice in that sense? And where are you at the moment? And what's, what is happening next until the festival? So uh, after our, our sessions with Martina, uh, I started gathering material, which is the way that I'm working anyways uh, in, in my uh, practice. So I look into different uh, literature and uh, references and researches according to the uh, to the subject that I'm investigating. Mm -hmm. So also in this case, I read many interesting articles and books on AI, um, but also science fiction on AI. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in, there is this period when I bring everything together, I immerse into this research and. Uh, I make connections with uh, between the things that I've uh, I've been reading and researching on, and at some point I I, uh, I start working on a specific installation in the space, uh, trying to introduce the the notions and the uh, and the things that I have been reading. Uh, about trying to incorporate and incorporate uh, them in in a bigger installation, mm -hmm. uh, and now I'm right in the in this process, working also with uh, different uh, collaborators uh, uh, to produce an installation for Ars Electronica Festival uh, coming September. Yeah, we are definitely very excited to to see that then here uh, in September, and. Um, is it already possible to say what people can expect or would it be uh, maybe too early to talk about it? Um, and I'm particularly interested in like, what would you want visitors to, to see, feel and touch or what is the, 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 the attitude that they should leave than in your installation? Mm -hmm. So I could reveal some things maybe. Oh. Um, maybe first of all, I should mention here that uh, in every inst installation that I make, um, my ultimate goal, let's say, is to create um, uh, to create a situation or to create a space where people can enter and experience something specific and uh, have the you know have the time and the space to to uh, reflect, to understand, or to. Pro you know, to, to start a discussion afterwards, let's say. Mm -hmm. So this is also the case here. Um, this is going to be, again, an installation. I could maybe say for now that uh, it, it has some fictional elements uh, and in, it, it in, uh, incorporates uh, all the research that I've made uh, during these last months on AI and voice. And it will be uh, at a great extent, a listening experience. So mm -hmm. since we are now discussing about vocal interfaces mm -hmm. and of course vocal interfaces bring together the listening infrastructure, for me it was kind of interesting to, to uh, create a listening experience for the audience. That does not mean that the visual part won't be present, it, would, it will be present, but for me the main um, Goal is to make people listen. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
So I'm very curious to, to hear your installation then uh, at the festival. And as a very last question, I was wondering if you maybe have a, a fun anecdote uh, of something that happened during the residency that you would like to share with us here now. Um, well, maybe I would say two things. The one thing is that uh, I could share a funny anecdote, which is the following one. Uh, at some point, what, where, when I had this meeting with the actor, uh, that she would be making a voiceover for the installation. Uh, she's a super talented uh, Greek actor. She's called Sofia Kokali. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as I was uh, explaining here the idea and this, uh, this uh, fictional story about uh, uh, my uh, about this research and the installation at some point she stopped and she looked at me and she said I'm I'm sort of feeling that I'm talking to a cyborg knight right now so this was a little bit uh, crazy and funny at the same time um, yeah this is what I maybe share uh, but besides that um, I would like to say that a very joyful moment uh, which actually has been extended to the last month. It's a long moment, let's say. It's the fact that um, I have been collaborating with all, all the, the, the teams from both Deutsche Telekom, Ars Electronica, and of course the uh, Kepler University. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is this joy in, during this last month that you see people that they are eager to support your research and the artistic production and they are all trying to you know uh, communicate and collaborate in the best possible way in order to make this happen and this is definitely something that uh, makes me happy wow that is the most beautiful thing actually to hear and uh, <laughs> a great opportunity also to wrap up this interview, thank you so much, Kiriaki, for having been a part of this show and having me, uh, our, our being part of this wonderful program. See you thank soon. You it was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. And now I'm excited to welcome the next guest, the mentor of the art science program, Professor Martina Mara. She is professor and head of the Robot Psychology Lab at the Johannes Kepler University here in Linz and she visits us regularly here in our home delivery session. I'm not surprised uh, because her research and expertise lies at a very interesting intersection as the name of her very own lab, Robot Psychology Lab, already implies. Welcome Martina Mara, thank you so much for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, you are a regular here at Ars Electronica, you also worked here before. Does it feel a bit like coming home as well when you're here? Yes, it does. Um, I spent many years working at Ars Electronica and I'd say, you know, the open, creative, interdisciplinary, educational spirit here definitely helped in defining my approach to research. So in this regard, uh, it really feels a bit like home. And um, saying this, may I use the Ars Electronica Center as my home office, actually? <laughs> I mean, that would be cool. Nice, I will definitely suggest that. Thanks. <laughs> Would love Check. to have you here even more often. Um, can you tell a little bit more about the Robo Psychology Lab and how it came to be? Yes, of course. You know, um, these days, so many people talk about digital humanism and um, human-centered technology and that we need to put um, the human, the people in the center of technological development. Uh, if we want to do that, we, we should look to psychology because psychology traditionally has been researching human perception, human experience, human behavior. So if we want to put the human at the center, um, psychology may be a, you know, a good um, 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 starting point to do that. And I'm super uh, excited that you also worked with uh, artists before, as a scientist, as a researcher. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, um, what is your personal take on why it can be fruitful to scientists to co collaborate with artists and through art? Yeah. Um, it can be very fruitful and very inspirational, you know. Um, if you collaborate with artists, um, you may get a complete different perspective on, on issues you're dealing with on your daily basis. Um, 
also, you know, through art and science collaborations, your issues or your research topics may be communicated in completely new ways um, to the public, which may be interesting to mm -hmm. researchers as well. Mm -hmm. But what I like a lot is that um, many artists and also Kiriaki, I think, um, create this, you know, alternative speculative visions or futures uh, mm -hmm. uh, we get you know we we get more open-minded and we get new ideas how our relationships with uh, machines for example um, could look like and um, it's really it can be really inspirational um, but also actually I think that not only scientists should <laughs> should collaborate with artists but virtually any anyone mm -hmm. um, because um, there's a quite pragmatic reason, you know. Um, what artists usually do very well, mm, uh, changing perspectives, mm -hmm. combining, you know, combining very different areas and aspects together, um, creating these speculative visions, these um, this new um, fictitious futures, being creative, um, uh, different kinds of inquiry. I think these are skills that are more and more in demand for anybody, also for business people, you know, yeah. for, for all kinds of professionals, because these are things that machines can't do. So I think we should also um, confront young people people and students at the bachelor's and master levels already with these kinds of artistic thinking because it's really valuable for our future. We need these skills. Yeah. Artists in businesses, <laughs> politics, science, universities, <laughs> everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> I totally agree and I will definitely work with you on this mission. And I think with this program we have already reached one step yeah. uh, or one example. Um, and maybe a very short question. Uh, what makes an art science collaboration a good one? A good one. Um, I think you need to um, meet each other at eye level, you know. Um, I think it's not a good one if um, I, as a scientist in this um, case, uh, would think that the artist anyway doesn't know anything about research and all my, you know, um, all the details about my methodologies and how I do my statistical analysis and so on and so on. And maybe the artist would say, well, um, scientists don't know anything about the art world and they don't understand my approach. So uh, this is definitely not a good base. So you have to. Um, go into this collaboration very open and on this eye level and um, then in the best case it's really inspirational mm -hmm. for both parties so both have to have a stake in this project you know in their common project mm -hmm. eye level connection that's yes. definitely a good, <laughs> a good base for many collaborations definitely, also. Yes. <laughs> cool um, and how was it to work with Kiriaki yeah, um, very enjoyable, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I think the meetings with Kiriaki, she in Athens, myself in Linz, <laughs> um, were among the most enjoyable Zoom meetings I had uh, during Corona times. <laughs> um, and we had a lot, we, had a, we have a lot in common actually, you know. Um, Kiriaki knows a lot about um, artificial intelligence, um, about human machine relationships. She also, um, she also asks very interesting questions about the future of our relations and our collaborations with um, AI systems, for example, um, which we at the Robo psychology lab also do mm. just with different kinds of methods but I, I for us it was also really um, enlightening and, and inspirational to um, learn from her from the artist herself about her ideas behind works such as um, counting craters on the moon for example mm -hmm. which I love mm -hmm. it's such a great work uh, Kiriaki um, did a few years ago I think mm -hmm. where um, she creates this imaginary dialogue between a German astronomer who was alive in the 19th century really existing person um, I think he was called um, Johann Schmidt mm -hmm. and his job was back in the 19th century to um, you know manually count craters on on the moon and draw them and name them and so on and nowadays we have deep neural nets who do that for mm -hmm. us who analyze um, planets and also the moon and who count craters and who are able to find, you know, thousands of craters 
um, in minutes. Mm. And this astronomer was able to find, you know, several hundreds maybe throughout his lifetime. And Kiriaki created this great and really poetic and interesting dialogue, imaginary dialogue between this now deceased astronomer and the deep neural net. And um, it's a quite um, inspiring take on how, you know, um, what humans can do, what machines can do, how we could collaborate. Um, yeah, it was, was really great. Yeah. So it was already like going to my last question, like what did you gain or learn from this experience? <clears throat> and it's, it's also like super ex ex uh, exciting to see like how this artwork can then deliver, like uh, build a storytelling tool yes. uh, and convey so much uh, depth uh, of a very uh, science-y maybe topic. Yes. Uh, and that a human was behind it before the data set was actually yes. like uh, able to do a different task of the same work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like the storytelling part mm -hmm. um, because, it, as I said before, um, stories about alternative, you know, relationships or futures um, open our minds, and it's a great starting point for <laughs> for whole humanity to, you know, to design this um, a positive future or to think about how a future with such intelligent machines should look like. Um, and we had great conversations about, especially about um, um, voice assistants, speech assistant systems, and um, the meaning of the voice, and also the synthetic voices that are, that are getting more and more realistic in their human likeness. Um, and I think this is something she, um, she still works on, mm -hmm. and, and I'm really curious to see her work uh, during the Ars Electronica Festival, which will also be some kind of speculative um, voice assistant. And um, for us at the Robo Psychology Lab, it will be really interesting how the audience mm -hmm. will react to, um, to this speculative vision. So this will be, I think, a major takeaway for us in mm -hmm. September during the festival to observe people watching, um, watching this installation and uh, reacting on this or uh, towards this, um, this vision that mm. Kiriaki created. Mm. Amazing, exactly. Thank you so much, Martina. Uh, I think, yeah, envisioning different uh, options for the future uh, is what we can definitely work with here. And thank you so much for this input. We will thank continue you. this and hopefully see at the uh, festival how we can leverage yes, this definitely. potential. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and as a next point, uh, I'm also very happy to show you the opportunity that Kiriaki had during her residency to also meet different people besides brilliant Martina uh, to exchange ideas around robotics and AI. She met Kenza Ait C. Abu, manager of, for robotics and AI at Deutsche Telekom IT. And how this looks like, we can actually become collectively a little mouse now and listen into their conversation that they had. Hello, everyone. And Welcome to a great talk between myself and <laughs> Kiryaki Goni. Uh, my name is Kenza Aitzi Abuliadini. I work at the IT department of Deutsche Telekom. And today I have the pleasure to talk with an artist. I'm very happy you're here. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us about uh, the art science residency and all the great stuff you do. Hi Kenza, it's, it's really a pleasure being here and having you know, the opportunity of discussing various things with you. I'm an artist based in Athens, Greece. Um, I have been working uh, during the last years on uh, technology and the impact that technology has in our own lives, everyday lives in the way that we perceive ourselves, society, the others, the environment. I have been focusing on networks, on infrastructures, on AI, and it's also in on to the relationships between machine and human, or human and other than human entities in general. Um, I have a background in social and cultural anthropology, and this um, 
gives my artistic practice a specific point of view, let's say. And maybe if I shortly describe the art science residency at um, Ars Electronica, collaboration with Deutsche Telekom and uh, Johannes Kepler Universität, um, I would say that uh, this is a very interesting first collaboration, which actually enables artists to communicate and collaborate with researchers and uh, investigate things that has to do with science and technology. In this specific case, I collaborated uh, with uh, Dr. Martina Mava and so we discussed various things. Among them was also the, the vocal interface and this is also actually what I'm going to present this year at Ars Electronica Festival. I loved the fact that you have a background in anthropology and, and social science plus arts and now you're um, digging into technology and how do you think that your diverse background influences your artwork? Actually very much because I, I'm also a person that you know it's, it's open to different uh, inputs and uh, observes and uh, listens very much. Um, I would say that this diversity is uh, maybe a fundamental part of my practice. And this is also sort of mirrored in the way that I, um, I use my materials in a way. So uh, at the end, the result is most of the times a multi uh, media installation that is actually an expanded installation which brings together different media and tries to to create stories and spaces and ecosystems let's say uh, which could host audiences and could uh, offer a, a space and time for for discussion and interaction um so let, let me ask you the next question. That is how you came up with the idea of putting, um, so the, your data garden project, okay? I understood it as an idea of extracting our data, our user data from the platforms and putting them in plants and planting them, well, very specifically in, in Greece, in the Acropolis, but um, I guess the idea can be, yeah. Uh, than anywhere. Uh, so th this forces us to take care of the plants, to take care of the environment, because the plants are the ones taking care of our uh, um, precious data. Uh, it started also from a very personal story, which involves my, my late grandfather, which actually uh, was really uh, taking care of his plants and garden and always sharing stories and talking to them in first person. So I think that it's also a memory of my childhood that, you know, uh, um, enabled a story like that take place in my mind and eventually become an artwork. Plants are the reason that we are living on this planet. So um, for me, through this work, of course, I wanted to um, underline things such as informational self-determination or uh, the climate crisis. But at the end, I also wanted to investigate possible interspecies relationships in a way and a possible solidarity or new kinds of solidarity with, uh, with uh, argo uh, organisms that other than human. So once we upload the data in the garden, uh, is there any download possibility? The idea in Data Garden, uh, which is partly fictional, of course, is also that the people, the community that they decide to upload the digital information of the DNA of the plants, have also the, uh, the possibility and the means to retrieve it at any time given. And uh, I should m mention here that this is an experiment that has had already happened. Uh, in, uh, back in 2016 uh, with Dr. Karin Fister, which managed uh, in her laboratory to actually encode uh, the, the phrase hello world and, 
and store it in the DNA of a specific plant and they manage also to retrieve it back. Do you see it yourself as an utopia? Uh, I would say that my work is a work that investigates the present and trying, tries to envision possible futures. Uh, sometimes through what is called dystopian scenarios and sometimes through what can be called utopian scenarios. But I wouldn't really use these labels for my work in a way. Should I maybe try to ask you some work? Or something? Of course, of course, yeah. I've been doing the talk, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for example, in Deutsche Telekom, how do you specifically deal with AI biases in order to be sure that these biases are at least minimized in a way? From a tech perspective, um, the artificial intelligence itself is not biased, but the data it learns from uh, is usually the problem. And the data we, uh, we use to teach the machines comes from our reality, uh, from our society, from our lives. And we humans are biased and this is how the bias gets into the data because it's just a representation of, of uh, uh, the human experience. And you should take care of removing this bias in the development process so that the machines don't learn it and reproduce it. And this is, as I said, it's a, it's a big research field. Mainly you try to do a sensitivity analysis, you know, where you have different features and you analyze how one feature influences the output of the neural network and how those features also influence each other. But at the end, you want to see how the, uh, the results of the neural network, how the decision has been influenced by, by the features. In the recruiting process, if you decide to remove the gender from your applications, that doesn't mean that the AI will decide upon the other qualifications and it will forget the gender. The gender is not labeled anymore, but it might be that the AI learns which gender it is depending on what's in the contents of, of your application. So let's say you visited a, I don't know, a, a female football club. That is a quite strong description uh, that maybe to 90% uh, your gender is female. So at the end, it will find it out. So the question is to identify how these gender features influence the decision if you are a good candidate or not for that specific position. Do you think that we can have a completely biased free AI? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I mean, in general terms, my personal view, my Kenza view is it is easier to make a system, to make a machine neutral than to make a person, a human being neutral. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it is easy. You need to do some hygiene in the data already. And when you have done that, that hygiene and you have made sure uh, after, after you trained your system that the decision it makes is really robust and doesn't depend on some biased aspects that you also defined earlier and that could also be biased. So that's why the whole process is actually quite complex. Uh, but let's say you manage to do that. Um, you end up with a system that has very low bias. I don't think you can make it 100% bias free, but very low bias. And then you put it live and then it starts interacting with people again and it starts learning their bias again and then you have it in the system again. So it is a, a continuous process mm -hmm. and we are still at the beginning. So, so what do you say as an anthropologist and a social scientist? You understand people better than I do for sure. <laughs> I, I think to a certain extent I would uh, agree with you that it might be easier to control a neural network person with person person's perspective but yet again in, in the process of the hygiene that uh, you mentioned this this word that you mentioned i suppose that also there uh, it has to be 
uh, ensured that uh, a diversity of people are working this process of hygiene in order to to really uh, achieve a near biased free situation. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I totally agree on the uh, the diversity of, of perspectives. Of course, you have to work on different um, stages of the of the development and uh, of the process. I mean, uh, this should be under the whole life cycle of a product. But in the development phase, I'm convinced that a diverse team uh, uh, is also one of the success factors of a biased free AI. Maybe it's better to bring together people with different biases and try to figure out a common base in order to train a machine and trying to maintain it as, as biased free as possible. Uh, I'm going to take the, the example of uh, Joy Wulamwini. Uh, I know you also read her research. She is a, uh, or she used to be an MIT um, uh, scientist developing uh, solutions um, uh, with, with facial recognition and how we, can, we interact with, uh, with uh, um, different applications. And while developing uh, her, her work, she realized that the camera on her laptop couldn't uh, identify her face. That triggered a huge research in facial recognition and how it is not working for a certain demographic, uh, mainly dark skin. And imagine you have a dark skin people in the development team of a facial recognition system. And uh, it's always like this. You have your data. Of course, you train the system. But the first thing you test it with yourself. So if you're a dark skin, you test the system and it's not working. Uh, you just uh, uh, redo it and, and develop further and, and change everything necessary to make it work also for a dark skinned person. You need to think about when you develop uh, technical or technological solutions. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a really uh, uh, an insightful discussion. It made me uh, think again. You can, so for me too, it was really a pleasure talking with you and yeah, hearing all this information from someone that is really active in this field. So thanks for your time. Thanks, and please keep uh, keep doing art. We need you. <laughs> Humanity needs you more than ever. <laughs> Bye. This was already the last part of today. What a wonderful round of guests we had. It was a real pleasure and I already from my side would like to say goodbye and I'm actually happy to give the last words to Christina who is with us now again. Christina. Thank you so much Laura for hosting this special edition of User Manual for Digital Humanists and for giving us such fantastic insights into the Deutsche Telekom residency by Kiriaki Goni. We were super happy to have you here today and to host the show for us. In August, we're looking forward very much to chapter five of the user manual and sharing with you what we will be up to within the European platform for digital humanism at this year's Ars Electronica Festival, a new digital deal from September 8 to September 12. You can also follow along with what's happening on the European platform for digital humanism on Twitter, Instagram, and the Ars Electronica blog. See you in August for chapter five of the user manual for digital humanists. <laughs>